Well, for those uh, who have not been been with us, maybe visiting today, or if uh, you haven't been here for a while, just a reminder of uh, we're going through the uh, the book of Joshua, and we're doing this for a reason because while we're here uh, at uh, Ocean Park Baptist, I believe the Lord's preparing us for uh, the promised land of the of the building that that He has uh, provided for us that we're in the midst of building. And, and in Joshua's time, uh, God was preparing his people uh, that they would be uh, w- his light to the nations. And he was preparing them uh, not just to conquer the land, he was preparing them to trust him and to be the kind of people uh, that he wanted them to be. That they, they might truly be a reflection uh, of him to the nations around them. A blessing to the nations as God had called uh, Abraham long before to be. And so that's what's happening in the book of Joshua. God is preparing them as a people to occupy the land. Uh, And and I believe he's preparing us in this time as we we wander here at Ocean Park Baptist for a time. He's preparing us to be the people he wants us to be, to be a light for the gospel in the new land that he's calling us to, that we get to go watch, uh, we get to go uh, see what the, the uh, the update of what's been going on firsthand uh, today, which which is exciting. Now, for those who may just be stepping into Joshua, uh, as it was reminded to me, and hearing it out loud, it's a little more striking. This is a violent book. It is a violent book. If you ever wanted to know where does uh, J.R. Tolkien get uh, the imagery for many of the battles that, that he wrote about, uh, and Lord of the Rings and, and the Cimmerillion and his works, uh, it comes from Joshua. A lot of that imagery comes from Joshua. Of course, Tolkien was also uh, fought in World War I and was in the trenches, and so he saw things firsthand. But it, it is a violent book, and it can, be, it can be hard to kind of reconcile, can it? Uh, and so I'll remind you, I mentioned it weeks ago when we were uh, really getting into the battle of Jericho. Uh, we have to understand that what's going on here isn't a universal principle that God has called uh, his people to wipe out uh, all those who are, are opposed to, uh, to the one true God. This, this, this isn't that at all. This is a specific instruction, a specific time. It's a time of judgment that God has placed upon uh, the, the Canaanites, the Amorites, uh, all those ites that were living in the land of Canaan. Uh, God had waited 700 years. 700 years he had waited uh, for them in hopes that they would turn and turn to him. And, uh, but the time of judgment has come. And this isn't just a, a, a judgment, uh, a, a physical judgment. This is a spiritual judgment. God is going to war with the false gods of the Canaanite people. And he is showing themselves to be superior, that they, uh, that, they, that they cannot overcome him. And so it does seem violent. Uh, and it is. We can't, right, we're, we're not, not, can't just uh, explain it away. We have to accept it uh, for what it is and how serious God is about demonstrating his righteousness and who he is and using his people uh, as his holy army to bring the, this cleansing that he has called them to. But, but the book is also full of grace. It's full of grace and sometimes in some unexpected places. And we see that in particular, I believe, in this passage in Joshua 10 this morning. Last week we were introduced to the Gibeonites. Uh, Chuck preached uh, a sermon on, on Joshua 9. But do you remember the Gibeonites came to, uh, they had seen what had happened at Jericho. Uh, they had seen what had happened at Ai. Uh, they knew that, the, that this massive army of the Lord was coming. Uh, and so they decided, and, and they were fearful of it. Uh, and they recognized that there was something that was going on here, that God was with them and was, they were having great success. And so their idea of out of this fear, a, a right fear by the way, uh, their idea how they should act out of this fear was to deceive the people of Israel and Joshua. 
And so they came to them and they told them that they were, they were from a far off land, but they had heard what God had done and they wanted to make a covenant with the people of Israel, a treaty. And, uh, and so the people of Israel uh, questioned them a bit, but then made that agreement with them that they would, uh, that they would, be, uh, that they would be partners in this or that they would not destroy them. Only then to find out that these were the Gibeonites. These were people of the land of Canaan. Uh, they had tricked them. And so when they found out, they went and they, they, they faced them. But they, what, what, what did they deserve, the Gibeonites? They deserved to have the treaty ripped up uh, and, to, uh, and for to have the full judgment of God upon them. But that's not what happened. Actually, the opposite happened. They said, no, we made a treaty with you. And we will honor that. If we, if we don't honor that, then God's wrath will be upon us. Only you will, be, you will serve the Lord and his altar by being woodcutters and serving the table. Uh, that's what, what you will be within our midst. And so uh, that's how the Gibeonites are introduced. These people who deceived the Lord received an incredible grace. They didn't deserve what they got. They got far more than they deserved. They deserved to be wiped out. But God honored the treaty that had been made, and spared them. And so here in Joshua 10, we, we run into these Gibeonites again. Uh, and we run into a testing of what this treaty is really going to do for them. And so we, we learn in chapter 10 that the five kings of the, of the, of the region uh, of the hill country have come out to fight against the Gibeonites. They had heard the Gibeonites had made this treaty. They're now in cahoots with the, these Israelites. Uh, this is a strategic location, uh, Gibeon is, that we, uh, we can't just sit by and let this happen. And so they raised up all the, the major kings of the hill country, and they assembled together, these five kings assembled their armies together and made war against the Gibeonites. Uh, and so we're told... And we see that the Gibeonites are fearful. They're, they're full of fear. And we'll get more into that in just a moment. And I guess it's for obvious reasons, right? If you've got these five kings and all their armies coming against you, you're going you're gonna to be afraid. But there's a, a less obvious reason for why they would be afraid as well. And I think the, the fear that they're feeling is a fear that Israel is going to abandon them. There's a fear... That Israel, and by, by connection, God himself, who they've seen do all these mighty works, is going to abandon them. That God and Israel are going to relax their hand. Why? Why would they have that fear? Well, I think there's a number of reasons, but because they had deceived in the first place, right? They had deceived, and so they knew in their own hearts that they had tricked them into making that covenant... Uh, and, and out of that, you know, that uh, out of fear about what God would do to them, and what he had seen happen in Jericho, uh, but they, when they found out they didn't break the treaty, the people of Israel, as I said before, the covenant stood. But now that calamity is upon them, and the mighty, these mighty warriors, which we were told the people of Gibeon are mighty warriors, they're afraid. They're afraid that Joshua and, and Israel and by extension then God himself is going to abandon them. All they had to count on was the grace of God. That's all they had to go on. Because they certainly didn't do anything to earn the right, did they? They did quite the opposite. They deceived. They had earned the right to be, uh, they had, out of their own uh, deviousness, to be destroyed. They had earned the right to be neglected in this moment of their greatest need. And, there, and then their heart of hearts, they knew it. They knew it. Now all they could rely upon was the good graces of Joshua and Israel and of God himself. So they cried out for help. Come up, they said. Come up quickly and save us and help us. That's all they could do in this place of need, this place of complete fear, was to cry out to God, help us, save us. So what did Joshua and Israel and God do with these devious sinners? 
who had tricked the people of Israel and God himself. What would God do with them? Well, the first thing we're told is that Joshua went, went quickly. He responded. He responded quickly, making, uh, making, marching throughout the night, which was not an easy thing to do. And especially if you knew cut the next when you got there, you were going straight to battle. Marching through the night uh, was something that was dangerous. If anyone who studied history, uh, you'll, if you in the Roman Empire, uh, if you've ever studied, uh, uh, I was, I've been listening to the short history of podcast. I highly recommend it if you haven't listened to it. Uh, it's really, really helpful. But uh, when you listen to the the great uh, slave revolt in Spartacus and the historical the narrative of it, what what got Spartacus in the end and all of their great army was that they were surprised. Because Pompey's army marched through the night, his legion, and they weren't expecting it when he got there, and they were defeated. The same thing happens here. They marched through the night to get to them. They came quickly. They risked it all. They pushed harder to come and help to save these devious, sinful people who had tricked them. And when they got there, they took the Amorite king by surprise. Secondly, we see that God was with them. And we see that in a number of ways. Number one, God gave his assurance. In verse 8, the Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear them, for I have given them into your hands. So God, by supporting Joshua in all this, is supporting the Gibeonites. These sinful, devious tricksters. Secondly, in verse 10, we see that the Lord, uh, through them, through the, the five kings and their armies, into an absolute panic before Israel. So God is reaching. God is helping. God is answering their cry for help, even though they didn't deserve it. And then in verse 11, the Lord threw down large hailstones upon the Amorites, killing more than the Israelites did with their swords. God was involved. God was supporting the Gibeonites. And number four, the big one, the big one, and who says that, that our God isn't without a bit of pizzazz, right? Verses 12 to 14, the sun stopped in the midst of heaven and did not hurry to set for about a whole day. There has been no day like it before, we're told, or since, when the Lord heeded the voice of a man, Joshua, for the Lord fought for Israel. God was in this. Why would God go to such an extent to make the sun set still in the sky? Because again, he's making it clear this is a spiritual battle. He's defeating these false gods, these demons that they're being worshipped in the land of Canaan. And he is defeating them. He is there. He doesn't want anyone to mistake it that this is just a bunch of, uh, just an army coming in who's mightier, who's going to get the glory. He's making it very clear that it's him, that he's the one. And so finally the five kings were defeated as they were hiding in those caves. And we read about that. So Joshua, Israel, and God did all of this for a bunch of undeserving deceivers. Yeah, it's true that this battle served a greater purpose, right, of, of continuing the purpose of the conquest of the land. It certainly did, but there were, could have been better, more advantageous ways for, for Israel have to entered into battle with these kings. But what an incredible picture, even in the midst of all the violence, in the midst of all the judgment, what an incredible picture of God's grace at work for the Gibeonites. And I think as we look at get this this morning together, this evening together, Joshua 10, we are the Gibeonites. We're the undeserving recipients of the grace of God. I know we want to be the mighty warriors. Uh, I know that's who we, we want to be. We want to be Joshua. We want to identify with all of them. But in this, in this account, we're the Gibeonites. Romans 5, 8. But God showed his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
while we were still sinners, while we were just like the Gibeonites, God rushed in to save us. He knew the cry of our heart for help and for salvation, and he came. But because we've been saved by the grace of God alone and his son, Jesus Christ, by grace alone, we struggle with it. Just like the Gibeonites did. They had received grace, but it was a struggle to be able to trust God. So that when the face of, of a great army was in front of them, they were full of fear. It's hard for us to trust because of the grace we've received that he's with us in our greatest time of need. It's hard to trust that he's going to actually deliver us. It's hard for us to trust that, that he'll provide for what we need when we need it. Not what we want when we want it. Now, if we had done something to earn our salvation, if we had been done something that we could cling on to and we could, we could call God on, then we could demand God to act on our behalf. Well, I did my part of the bargain. Now you've got to do your part of the bargain. But instead, God has called us to trust him alone. To trust his grace alone. And that, my friends, is the hardest thing of all. We're all afraid on some level that God is going to relax his hand. Just as the Gibeonites were afraid. We're afraid that God's going, not going to come through. In other words, that, that word relax, it, it would, another way of translating it is to abandon. There's this part of us, in every single one of us, there's, there's a fear that God's going to abandon us. And, and it's that fear of abandonment from God that makes us do some really unhealthy things. It's that heart that, that, that fears that abandonment that makes us act out of it. Uh, one of those things is we build up walls in our relationships with God, and we build up our walls with relationships with others. We're probably, we, we can become afraid of being vulnerable with people, because being vulnerable means that we're, we're, we're just opening ourselves up to being hurt. Because we think that we can't trust God. That he's really going to be with us. That if we are vulnerable, that he'll always be there to save us. And that he'll never leave us or forsake us. Another way is that uh, in our fear, we have this tendency to quickly attach ourselves to people and things other than God. To look to them for our help. To cry to them for, uh, for salvation. We can't trust that God's going to be the one to help us. Because we have this fear of abandonment. So we had better get obsessed about our financial portfolio, right? We better pay attention every day to the state of the market. Because those are the things that are going to save us. Because God will abandon us. We may not say it outright, but we're think deep in our hearts, we're thinking it. And it's coming out. Or maybe it's this. We had better be overly controlling of our children's lives and not give them freedom to make their own mistakes. You know, the whole helicopter mom and dad thing. <laughs> it's a great temptation because it's hard because we think God's not going to be there to help them. I've got to do it. I've got to be the one to save them. I've got to be the one to protect them from every bad thing that could ever happen to them. Why? Because we have a fear that God will abandon and that he won't act to help and to save. Another is that in our fear of abandonment, we can have this tendency to run away from relationships, from growing closer to God, because again, we're afraid that he's going to leave us, or from running from other people, because we have this fear that they're going to let us down as well. Or how finally this one, a fear in our, out of our fear of abandonment, it causes us to become emotionally unavailable. Even to the people that we love most in our lives. Even to God. 
Maybe you prefer in worship that, uh, that becomes dry and rote because you're, you're we're, because become afraid that if we really give ourselves fully over to the Lord, because what if he doesn't show up? What if he doesn't show up? What if he isn't there? What if he doesn't come to meet me in my time of need? How about in our marriages or our closest relationships and friendships? We can become afraid out of this fear of abandonment to be emotionally available because what if our spouse or our friend, our loved one, what if they don't reciprocate it? So we just become unavailable to protect ourselves. All of this stems from our spiritual insecurity. We're fragile. Because in the depths of our heart, we are incredibly insecure. We do not believe that God is going to help us. We do not believe that God is going to save us. We don't believe that God is going to be there when we really need him. Just like the Gibeonites. But the hope of the gospel is this. That just as God fought For those deceiving Gibeonites, by his grace alone, God always comes to help us. He always comes to save us when we cry out to him. The God who sent his son into the world to die for us while we were still sinners. While we were still deceivers. He promises us, that same God, never to leave us. And never to forsake us. Every struggle we face may not be as overwhelming or as obvious as Joshua 10 and the five kings of the Ammonites standing uh, and making war against us. But we know, even in what we're facing, that as Paul proclaimed in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57, God has given us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Things may not always work out the way that we want them to, but we know that we have been given the ultimate victory and Jesus' victory over sin and death itself and his resurrection from the grave. And because of that, we're free. We're free to let God and others into our lives. We're free from the need to rely on the stock market and ourselves as our children's saviors and protectors. We're free to stay in relationships, even the really difficult ones and the risky ones. Because God is with us always, even to the end of the age. We're free to make ourselves emotionally available to God and to people in our lives because He's here. And He is reigning victorious. All because... We are fully secure in our relationship with God because of the finished work of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Do you know that kind of freedom? Have you found yourself emotionally unavailable to the people you love? Or maybe you've been hiding away from God out of fear. Have you found yourself facing these fears of, of abandonment of God? Maybe you've given up hoping for things or expecting God to show up because you've been hurt so many times because things haven't worked out the way that you want them to. But what we're learning at Joshua 10 and what God wants to prepare in us is a heart for a people who are going to be a light to the nations is that we be a people of great expectation that he is with us. That we've been given the victory and that he will never leave us or forsake us. Even if he doesn't show up the way that we may want him to in the moment, he shows up the way that we need him to every time. Friends, our relationship with God is ruled by grace. Not by law. Let us rejoice. And let us find freedom in the victory that we've been given. Amen.